Okay, welcome everyone. Um, we're gonna start the session now, um, session 2D on security and persistence. So this is your last chance to exit if this is not the session that you intended to be in. Um, first up, we have Isaac Sheff and uh, his colleagues at Cornell um, who will be presenting a paper on uh, safe, serializable, secure scheduling transactions and the trade-off between security and consistency. Um, that's some very nice alliteration. Um, so please, take it away. Hi. I'm Isaac Sheff, and I'm here to present some work that I did with the Applied Programming Languages group at Cornell with Andrew Myers and Tom Magrino and Jed Liu and Robert Bermanesse. Um, people want distributed systems that store information both securely and consistently. Now, as far as consistency goes, they want that the uh, state that they observe of the distributed system to reflect in some way the state that other people observe of the distributed system. And meanwhile, we want systems to be secure. We want secret or trustworthy information to be isolated to prevent leaks or taint. And we want anybody making changes uh, to be sure that they have the authorization necessary to do so. Fundamentally, what we observe is that there is this inescapable trade-off between security and consistency in distributed systems. Not all transactions can be uh, securely serialized. But what we've also begun to explore is what can be done, and we've developed a protocol and implementation uh, which can accomplish some things that we know to be safe. So before I dive into our work, some background. Uh, transactions are a tool for programming distributed systems uh, that provide consistency through the illusion of serialization. Specifically, each transaction is a program which can affect state that's observed by other transactions. And we want to run these as concurrently as possible, but to help programmers avoid the many pitfalls of concurrent programming, the code can be written in each transaction as if it's the only thing running in the system at the time. Um, we provide serializability, which is the illusion that one transaction runs from start to finish, and then another, and then another, and then another, and then another. The state which any transaction observes should reflect some global serial order of all the transactions that have happened so far. By far, the most popular protocol for achieving serializability in, two -phase, uh, uh, in distributed systems is two-phase commit, which is positively ubiquitous in uh, transactional distributed systems. So let's consider an example to illustrate the problem. Suppose that Patsy is a doctor working at a hospital, and Patsy is relatively trusted. But at the same hospital, Mallory is a less trusted employee working in, say, marketing. Each uses her own computer, and she completely controls the computer and uses it to access the hospital database. The database contains patient records, and for each patient, this contains, amongst other things, the patient's HIV uh, uh, status and their mailing address. Patsy is trusted to read and write both of these values, but Mallory is less trusted. She can only read and write the mailing address. The database, uh, um, sorry. Patsy wants to assemble a list of patients uh, with HIV, and specifically the mailing address of each. For each patient, she runs a transaction which checks if the patient has HIV, and if they do, uh, reads the address and prints it. However, Mallory wants to learn if patients have HIV, something she's not permitted to know, but Mallory is devious. For each patient, Mallory runs a transaction in which she makes some minor update to the patient's address. Uh, in this case, she adds a space at the end. She runs her transactions as best she can at the same time as Patsy's. And to be clear, we're talking about distributed transactions, so Patsy and Mallory's computers are involved in the transaction commit process. Patsy's transaction will read the patient's HIV status, and given that this patient does have HIV, it will go on to read the address. Meanwhile, Mallory's transaction uh, attempts to write to the patient's address, and this creates a read-write conflict. It, the address that Patsy will read will be different depending upon whether or not her transaction is scheduled before or after Mallory's, and that means that the transactions can't be run concurrently. The way two-phase commit works, one of them will have to abort. And suppose that Mallory's transaction is the one that's aborted. Uh, 
when Mallory learns of this abort, she knows that some other transaction is interacting with the address at that time. And if she believes that Patsy's transactions are the only ones likely to be on the system at the time, and Patsy only reads a patient's address that the patient has HIV, she learns that the patient has HIV. This attack is not purely theoretical. We have implemented it. And specifically, we set up these transactions in Fabric, which is our uh, distributed object store with information flow security, enforcing the HIV status and the address access policies. Patsy and Mallory ran their transactions about once a second uh, for about 90 minutes. And to increase Mallory's ability to issue her transaction at just the right moment to uh, intersect Patsy's and trigger an abort, we instituted a 100 millisecond latency between Patsy and the database, uh, which is not unreasonable if you consider that they could be connecting over the internet. Approximately every 20 seconds, which is to say about 5% of the time, Mallory received an abort. She learned that a patient has HIV. Now, we constructed this merely as an example uh, that the threat is real. There are probably ways to optimize this in real life, but the fact is that the attack worked. Now, the astute programmer will note that there is a relatively straightforward fix for Patsy's information leak. Instead of reading the patient's address only after learning that the patient has HIV, Patsy should read the patient's address first. That way, Mallory will abort uh, when she runs her transaction while Patsy's is running, regardless of whether or not the patient has HIV. So even if the patient doesn't have HIV, uh, Mallory will still receive an abort. She doesn't really learn anything beyond the fact that Patsy is running at the same time. The natural thing to wonder then is whether all of the transactions in the universe can be so easily remedied. Uh, is it possible to build a scheduling algorithm which will securely serialize all transactions? And the answer is no. Even when each transaction by itself is secure, there are some situations where it's just impossible to schedule a set of transactions securely and without deadlock. Our proof follows a counterexample. So consider this example of some transactions where we would like to maintain security while enforcing some kind of consistency, but we'll see what can go wrong. I claim that no protocol can securely serialize uh, these transactions under some basic assumptions. So we'll start with four locations. Alice and Bob each run a cloud computing system and their competitors. Carol and Dave are customers and they each have a computer of their own. In this universe, there are no other trusted parties that they can trust to make decisions for them. So Bob and Alice don't want their information to flow to each other. That is to say that nothing that happens on either should affect or inform anything that happens on the other. Furthermore, Carol and Dave consider their information confidential. Nothing from Carol's transaction should affect anything on Dave's computer. Uh, nothing on Dave's transaction should affect anything on Carol's computer. I'm drawing a wall here in the middle just to represent the idea that people on opposite sides of the wall don't want their information flowing to each other. Carol wants to run a transaction in which she stops a job on Alice's cloud and starts a job on Bob's cloud, effectively keeping one job running at all times. There are four things happening in Carol's transaction. Carol sends a message to Alice. Alice receives the message and does something with it. Carol sends a message to Bob. Bob receives the message and does something with it. The messages can be sent concurrently. We haven't enforced any kind of ordering on those. Um, now, as I said, nothing in this transaction should affect anything on Bob or his computer. And furthermore, um, B3 being the part of this transaction that happens on Bob's cloud shouldn't affect Alice or her cloud. And B2, the part that's on Alice's cloud, shouldn't affect Bob or his cloud. Dave is doing the same thing as Carol. Likewise, uh, Dave's transaction shouldn't affect uh, Carol or her computer. R3 shouldn't affect Alice, and R2 shouldn't affect Bob. The problem is that if we want to arrive at any kind of serial schedule, Carol and Dave's transactions have to be ordered. And for instance, Alice or Bob may want to maintain a totally ordered log of who started and stopped what when. And Alice and Bob would have to agree on an ordering of red and blue transactions. So Alice's ordering of R2 and B2 would have to agree on Bob's ordering of R3 and B3. Now we'll see where this gets tricky. Suppose Carol and Dave start their transactions. So Dave sends his message to Alice, Carol sends her message to Alice, Dave sends his message to Bob, and Carol sends her message to Bob. 
Now we make the popular asynchronous network assumption uh, that messages can arrive at any time after they're sent and there's no way to know in what order or after how long. So Carol and Dave's messages will arrive at Alice and Bob eventually, but we don't know which will arrive when. Suppose that Dave's message arrives at Bob's cloud first and Carol's message arrives at Alice's cloud first. We assume that the locations don't know in advance which transactions are going to happen. Uh, if they did, scheduling would be pretty easy. But that means that with our networking assumption, Alice has no way of knowing how long she should wait before committing Carol's transaction first. And likewise, Bob has no, long, no, no idea how long he should wait before committing Dave's transaction first. Ultimately, there's nothing we can do to prevent blue transaction from being ordered before red on Alice's cloud and red transaction before blue on Bob's cloud, which means that these transactions are not serializable. There's no serial order that puts blue before red and red before blue, which is why despite each transaction on its own being secure, no protocol can securely serialize these two. So no protocol can securely serialize all the possible sets of transactions, which raises the natural question, what can we serialize and how do we serialize it? We don't have complete answers, but we do have a relatively straightforward condition, which we call monotonicity, and it is possible to serialize any set of monotonic transactions. In fact, our protocol staged commit uh, can do it, and we've implemented that protocol in Fabric. To explain what monotonicity is, I have to tell you a little bit about, uh, more about our model. We use information flow control security, which uh, was mentioned in an earlier talk in this, session, in this uh, track. And just from a thousand mile high viewpoint, first consider isolation. You have one of the basic concepts of security. You have two sets of information, in this case red and blue, and uh, they're not supposed to affect each other in any way. But sometimes you, there are times when you want data to affect other groups of data. Perhaps we want red data to be able to affect blue data. But just because red data can affect blue data does not necessarily mean that blue data should be able to affect red data. And so these flows are specified one direction at a time. In practice, this means that we can think of each datum as being tagged with an information flow label. And the label represents uh, the confidentiality and integrity policies on that datum. So we have some transitive relation flows to which determines whether information with one label can uh, affect information with another. We draw that with this square subset or equal to symbol. Like Lamport and a bunch of other distributed systems theorists, we model system state as the set of all the events that have happened so far. This has some strict partial order, but not necessarily a total order. It's possible for two events, like R0 and B0 at the bottom, uh, to be simply unordered. These events are, uh, for all intents and purposes, concurrent. We model transactions simply as sets of events. Happens before relationships uh, such as a read and a write to the same data can span transactions. Uh, they obviously have to be able to affect the same state. But not all events are part of a transaction, like W0 here. There may be some events that are part of some non-transactional program. And in fact, the scheduling algorithm itself is not a transactional program and has to be composed of events. Our entire system state is encoded in these events. Now, for consistency, we want to have some notion of ordering on transactions. And specifically, we want to order them in a way that is consistent with the happens before relation on events. So if we have an event in one transaction, in this case red, that happens before an event in another transaction, in this case blue, I recall that happens before is transitive, then we have that red transaction happens before blue transaction. So now we're ready to explain our sufficient secure scheduling condition, monotonicity. A transaction needs two things to be monotonic. Uh, first, it needs to be secure, which means that for any two events in the same transaction, if one event happens before another, then the label of the first event has to flow to the label of the second event. This ensures that whenever one event causes another, uh, the cause is permitted to affect the effect. Another thing that's necessary for monotonicity is that events within each transaction be totally ordered. That means that forks like we have here where this event and this event are not uh, ordered relative to each other cannot be allowed in the same transaction. So these are single threaded transactions. So let's return to our hospital example and see if these transactions are monotonic. Uh, well, here's Patsy's original code. 
And Patsy's transaction starts, which is an event in its own right, and let's say that malware is allowed to know about that one. Uh, then Patsy checks the patient's HIV status. In this case, the patient does indeed have HIV. Recall that Patsy, but not Mallory, is permitted to know about this event. Because the patient does have HIV, Patsy then reads the patient's address. Now, the address is more public. Patsy and Mallory are both permitted to know about this one. Then Patsy prints out the address. As this event really only affects Patsy, uh, and Patsy is the only principal authorized to know about this event. Now, in general, Patsy and Mallory are both allowed to affect the first event, and Patsy is allowed to affect the uh, second event, so it's okay for information from the first to flow to the second. Um, but that's not the case for the second event and the third. The second event allows Patsy, um, only Patsy, to know about the information, and the third also allows Mallory, and in general, information can flow that way. However, Recall that earlier we had this intuition for a way to fix Patsy's information leak. And it turns out that when we do that, we're changing the order of events, and now our intuition tells us that things should be okay. And in fact, monotonicity lines up with our intuition. These labels are now monotonic. Uh, each flows to the next. Mallory's transaction is much simpler. When she starts, first she reads the address, and then she writes it. Uh, all of these events are observable to both Patsy and Mallory, so her transaction is naturally monotonic. So given that both of these are monotonic, our protocol should be able to uh, schedule them. Let's take a look at how that works. Staged commit divides up each uh, transaction into stages, which are just sets of events with equivalent labels. Given uh, this transaction, we'll say that it has three stages. It's got a green label stage, a blue label stage, and a red label stage. Each event uh, in a monotonic transaction, uh, events in a monotonic transaction are totally ordered, and events have labels that each flow to the next, so the stages are also totally ordered in some sense. In staged commit, we use a two-phase commit on each stage. Essentially, we're going to execute the stages with pessimistic locking, but when two-phase commit finishes on each stage, we don't call it committed, we call it pre-committed. And a pre-committed event will eventually be committed, but until then, every other transaction that's trying to schedule anything that conflicts with it uh, will have to abort and try that stage again. Once a stage is pre-committed, uh, two-phase commit will run for the next stage, and that pre-commits, and so on. When each stage tells the next that it's done pre-committing, it knows that it will eventually receive a commit from the next stage. Uh, until then, it just waits, and all events stay pre-committed. When a stage is trying to pre-commit and it gets an abort, it just keeps retrying that stage over and over until it succeeds. Eventually, all the stages will become pre-committed, and the final stage can then commit. Uh, these events are considered scheduled, so it is now okay for other conflicting events to be scheduled. They will happen after these. When each stage commits, its predecessor can commit until eventually all the stages are committed and the transaction is complete. Staged commit serializes transactions. It's secure and it's deadlock free for any set of monotonic transactions. And I'll briefly go over how we show that. We know that within a transaction, information doesn't leak. The only way that information with later, more secretive labels can flow to earlier ones is through the timing of commits. And we're basically ignoring timing channels here. Uh, there's a lot of great work in, in uh, timing channel mitigation. Some of it's in our group, but that's orthogonal to this. When it comes to information leakage between transactions, we assume the conflicting events have the same label. And that makes sense if you think of conflicting events as, for example, uh, touching the same datum where the datum sets the information policy. Therefore, if two transactions conflict, it'll be in stages with the same security label, which means that it's okay for events in one to affect events in the other. If, uh, in terms of deadlock freedom, this kind of conflict will trigger uh, some kind of abort in one or the other of the stages, uh, and it will retry until it succeeds. Meanwhile, the other transaction, which doesn't abort, will be pre-committed and, and get to move on. Eventually, it will commit, and the transaction which had to abort will get its turn. Now, if there are two transactions which have conflicts in multiple stages, then by the transitivity of the flows to relation, these stages happen in the same order in both transactions. That means that we can't create wait cycles. Essentially, we're always grabbing locks on, on uh, stage labels in the same order. As a result, staged commit is deadlock free. So let's take a look at our hospital example again. 
Recall that Mallory's write to the address field uh, and Patsy's read of the address field conflict. They have to be ordered by the protocol. So when we divide up these uh, transactions into stages according to their labels, we find that Patsy's transaction has two stages and Mallory's has one. And the labels of these stages uh, for the first stages match, which they should since there are conflicting events in the first two. So let's say that Patsy starts first. Uh, she gets her first stage pre-committed, and meanwhile, Mallory is trying to schedule her stage. But there's a conflict, and since Patsy is pre-committed, Mallory has to abort. According to stage commit, Mallory tries her stage again until eventually it goes through. So she will try to schedule it again, she'll receive a conflict again, it will abort again, and so on. Um, eventually, Patsy will schedule her second stage. It will be pre-committed, and since it's the final stage, it will commit. Um, once that's committed, Patsy can commit her first stage, and then when all of those events are committed, Mallory can go to retry her stage again. It will be able to pre-commit and finally commit. Uh, so stage commit successfully schedules our refactored hospital example. But at Cornell, we are the applied programming languages group. We don't just talk about algorithms and protocols. We build things. That's what we do. So. We implemented it. We implemented it. Uh, we built it in Fabric, which is our group's distributed object store and labeled language. It looks a lot like Java, but objects have locations and uh, security labels on them. Specifically, we made the compiler check transactions for monotonicity, and we implemented staged commit in the transaction scheduling protocol. Fabric actually has a lot of labels to describe specific policies. The labels that we created to describe the labels for this uh, work are called conflict labels. They encode which principles are authorized to read or write whatever field is involved in an event. So for dealing with a patient's address, this set includes Patsy and Mallory. In general, information can flow to subsets. A secret should never be passed to a broader set of principles. Since stages by nature have different labels, this means that earlier stages conflict labels should have strict supersets of the principles and later stages conflict labels. As a Java-based programming language, Fabric has dynamic dispatch, meaning that it's not always possible to know exactly which labels, uh, what the labels values will be when you're compiling a method. To deal with this, we annotate methods with bounds on what the labels can be before and after the method call. We check conservatively to make sure that these bounds ensure monotonicity. Um, with dynamic dispatch and also the fact that labels themselves can be calculated or read from storage, it's not always possible to know when two labels given as uh, uh, values or names are inherently equal. We use conservative estimates to ensure monotonicity and record all the places where conflict labels could change as potential stage points. At runtime, if two conflict labels are the same, then we fuse the two potential stages into one great big stage. And this is actually necessary for deadlock freedom. At runtime, if two conflict labels turn out to be the same, then two transactions could pre-commit the stages with these labels in different orders. Then each transaction would pre-commit its first stage. And so if there are conflicts between the events in the first stage of each and the second stage of the other, then which is to say conflicts between stuff that we know has the same label, uh, then neither can proceed and, and pre-commit its second stage until the other has, has completed, and that means deadlock. So that's why the labels uh, at a potential stage point turn out to be, uh, when they turn out to be equivalent, it's necessary to fuse them into one great big stage. Now, if they turn out not to be the same, then they have two genuinely different stages and we go through the whole staging process. That means that there are some runtime checks which uh, check whether two labels uh, are equal and it has to be added to the overhead. We adapted our hospital example from the attack demonstration to run in our new version of Fabric. And the compiler correctly rejected Patsy's original code as it was not monotonic. Um, the original code has 350 lines. Many of these are for setting up objects and labels for our experiment. And so to make them monotonic, we had to change 113 lines. 23 were adding annotations, and 90 lines were refactoring Patsy's code uh, to read the address first. It turns out that while we were grappling with the problem, we ended up significantly rearranging uh, how the transaction looks. 
We also worked with some exa uh, other example programs. For instance, we wrote a blog application where Alice creates a post readable to herself, Bob, and Carol. And Carol, in a separate transaction, reads the post and, depending upon the information in it, uh, makes a comment readable to herself and Alice, but not to Bob. So this is a simplification of what Carol's code looks like. Um, these transactions didn't have to be refactored. They're already monotonic. But of the original 352 lines of code, we did have to change 50 lines for annotations. Right now, our label annotations are very explicit types provided by the programmer. And type inference would almost certainly drop this burden enormously the way it does in, say, OCaml or Haskell. But we don't have that yet. We measure the runtime overhead that our changes uh, impose, and there are two significant sources. The dynamic label checks uh, when testing out whether a dynamic stage point has to fuse two things into one great big stage or actually stage the thing. And um, each stage itself involves running two-phase commit, which involves sending messages between participating locations. For each blog transaction, we ran three runs of five minutes each, looping each transaction over and over and over to see how fast it goes. And for Patsy's hospital transaction, we ran 20-minute uh, runs. These are the times that they took. Uh, in the absence of any kind of contention or any added network delay with about a 2% standard error. Each transaction has one stage in addition to the ones I've already described. You can think of this as being the start event uh, in its own stage. And it's the, the stage where the transaction deals with public metadata. The dynamic checks run relatively quickly, but for some of the more complicated transactions, in the hospital example, the extra stage uh, does take a couple of milliseconds. Uh, the extra staging imposes a couple of extra milliseconds of overhead. So security and consistency have this fundamental trade-off and not all transactions can be securely serialized. We have a relatively straightforward, sufficient condition, monotonicity, for transactions that can be serialized. And we've developed staged commit uh, as a protocol which can securely schedule monotonic transactions, which we've implemented with a compiler to check whether uh, transactions are monotonic in a distributed system that runs the staged commit protocol. There is more in the paper, which I haven't had time to talk about. Uh, we actually slightly relaxed uh, monotonicity, so staged commit can handle even more transactions. And we have some necessary conditions for secure schedulability, and there's still quite a bit of a, a gap to explore between our known necessary and sufficient bounds. I'd like to thank uh, my co-authors, especially Tom and Jed, who did most of the implementation, and ask if there are any questions. Okay, we have time for one or two questions. Um, if you have one, please uh, step up to the mic. Hi, Tamara hey. from INRIA. Thanks for this excellent talk. Thank uh, you. I wanted to ask you, um, you, uh, you don't handle time, but it seems like uh, Mallory, in your example now, if she cannot access immediately to the address, she will also infer that the patient has a, a condition. So do you see an easy way to, to solve this problem? I don't have a lot of easy answers for timing attacks. And like I said, that's really an orthogonal field. Um, in Mallory's case here, the database will find itself scheduling uh, that stage over and over, and so the time it takes for it to respond to Mallory will probably vary depending upon whether Patsy is running at the same time. Um, if you're willing to dig into the literature, there's a lot on how to mitigate this kind of timing channel, but that's not really what I do. OK, thanks. C can I ask another question? Yeah, please. OK. Um, you also said um, that you don't have deadlocks, uh, but what about starvation? For example, if uh, the um, transaction for uh, the doctor uh, never terminates, then Mallory will never have an opportunity to do something. Right, so that would represent an integrity failure on the part of somebody uh, storing or participating in the transaction. And that means that their integrity failure can influence later stages in the transaction. Uh, they can um, effectively prevent those things from being available to other transactions. So we, with, with our system, we isolate what can harm you to what you trust, but that doesn't mean that you are you know, free from vulnerabilities. 
Okay, thanks. Okay, let's thank the speaker one more time.